So we are delighted to have today with us Professor Nicolas Grigiscorte from Columbia University in our Bar Ilan University Vision Science Seminar. Nicolas Grigiscorte, sorry for the pronunciation, is a computational neuroscientist who studies how our brain enables us to see and understand the world around us. He received his PhD in cognitive neuroscience from Maastricht University, held postdoctoral positions at the Center for Magnetic Resonance Research at the University of Minnesota and the US NIMH, and was the program leader at the UK Medical Research Council Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit at the University of Cambridge. Craig Escorta is now a professor at Columbia University, affiliated with the Departments of Psychology and Neuroscience. He is a principal investigator and the director of cognitive imaging at the Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute at Columbia University. He is the co founder or the co founder of the Cognitive Computational Neuroscience Conference that started in September 2017 at Columbia University. He published many papers in top leading journals as Neuron, Nature, Neuroscience, PLOS Computational Biology, TICS, Annual Reviews of Visual Sciences, and others. He has an H index of 58, according to Google Scholar, with more than 22,000 citations. He has published several extremely influential papers that have reshaped the field of cognitive neuroscience. And here I would like to mention two. One of these published in Nature Neuroscience with almost 25,000 citations about the then prevalent circular analysis practices producing distorted descriptive statistics and invalid statistical inference, also referred to as double dipping, which paved the way to a profound change in the field towards independent and more reliable analyses and examinations. Another such influential paper published in Frontiers in Systems Neuroscience with almost 25,000 citations presented the representational similarity analysis or also termed RSA method that has overtaken the field and allowed to connect not only different branches of uh, systems neuroscience, but also examine similarities between patterns of activation, different types of measurements and computational models. From a personal perspective, I can say that the importance of these papers is both the conceptual advances that they present along with very practical and hands-on explanations that allow these ideas to easily be adopted and transform the field. So uh, let me stop here, although there's much more to say. I'd like to welcome you, Nico, to our seminar. Thanks for joining us to tell us about your work. Thanks so much, Sharon. That was about an order of magnitude too generous, no doubt. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, let's have let's have a, a chat. So, uh, how much time do we have? Sixty minutes. Um, so it, it depends on you. You can take forty up to sixty. That would be decent. And then usually people have questions. And I, looking at the audience, I assume there will be questions. Um, so yeah, uh, but then you are flexible to say how much you are uh, willing to uh, answer. And like, sounds good. Okay, my title today is Controversial Stimuli, Optimizing Experiments to Adjudicate Among Computational Hypotheses. So let's talk a little bit about um, what I mean by that title. So the basic point here is something that we're all very familiar with, which is that scientists always want to design experiments to adjudicate among competing theories. We want to learn something interesting from our experiments. So we want to think about our theories before uh, designing our experiments and then design experiments that can actually drive theoretical progress. And in perceptual neuroscience, our experiments often involve a choice of stimuli. So the experimental des design importantly uh, is the design of those, those stimuli. When our hypotheses are implemented in brain computational models, as is increasingly the case, we may need optimization techniques to make stimuli that elicit distinct predictions from different models. So the idea is if we want to adjudicate between models, we need for those models to make distinct predictions. And we can make sure that that's the case by choosing stimuli that the models make distinct predictions for. 
And that's the definition of controversial stimuli. So what we mean by controversial stimuli here is stimuli that are controversial among the models. So this is not about controversiality between two people or something like that, but it's controversiality between models or among a set of models. So this kind of controversiality, since it's among models, is something we can optimize before we engage our subjects. We can do this in the computer simulation of our model. We can present stimuli to the models. And for a given stimulus or set of stimuli, we can assess how controversial is this stimulus or stimulus set between for example, two models. And then we can optimize that and uh, the resulting stimulus might be a good stimulus to present in experiments. I wanna start with two examples from our own work where we didn't use controversial stimuli. And I wanna use these two examples to show you how uh, we need this technique, how we bump up against uh, limitations of uh, just using natural stimuli in our experiments. The first example is from the work of Camilla Jotswick and Kate Storrs with Jonathan O'Keefe. And it's a study in which we tried to explain human face dissimilarity judgments. So this was a behavioral study. Um, Camilla and Kate created these stimuli uh, using the Basel face model where you have this high dimensional uh, space of faces with uh, a large number of shape dimensions and a large number of texture dimensions. And this creates a face space in which you can choose a point that, that corresponds to a particular 3D face. They sampled slices through this face space that passed through the average face by defining three parameters. The first, one radius for one face, another radius for another face, and uh, the angle between them. So in this kind of, on the single slice of face space, they chose all possible combinations that you see here in this little uh, polar grid of pairs of faces that correspond to two radii and, and one angle. And then they performed a behavioral experiment on a large touch screen in our lab in Cambridge, where subjects were presented with these pairs of faces and they could kind of put their finger on the screen and then drag and drop those faces to positions along the vertical axis to indicate the dissimilarity of those two faces. And on the screen at the bottom, we had pairs of identical faces that you see here. And at the top, we had pairs of maximally different faces that corresponded to sort of op opposite um, extremes here in, in face space. So this was a way to get face dissimilarity judgments that are contextualized where subjects could sort of look at the other pairs in order to place each pair. Um, and that also very highly resolved because there's uh, a continuum along the vertical dimension. So potentially get very high, highly resolved uh, data more than if you did something like a Likert scale. Camila and Kate then used a wide variety of different models to try to explain the resulting face dissimilarity judgments. So they used the latent spaces of Basel, uh, the Basel face model to explain the judgments measuring distances between um, these latent vectors, as well as image computable models and a number of other representations. And here's the main result. And what we see here is that um, on, the, on the vertical, you see the model accuracy, which is the Pearson correlation of the representational dissimilarities predicted by each of these models and the face dissimilarity judgments. And we see that there are differences between models and some of the models don't really do so well, notably using just the Basel face model angle doesn't work so well, person attributes doesn't work so well, uh, using the pixels doesn't work so well, works significantly worse. 
But there's this set of models here that includes deep neural network models, as well as the Basel face model components that work very well and equally well. They're not, not significantly different here. So these are very qualitatively different uh, models, and we'd like to be able to adjudicate between them as models of the subjective um, perception of faces. However, we, we can't see significant differences here. So why can't we distinguish the models? We think is that it's because despite distinct mechanisms in these models, the models make similar predictions for natural or synthetic faces when those faces are not chosen expressly to discriminate between them. I'm gonna give a, a second example, and this is from the work of uh, Kate Stores. Kate found that diverse deep neural networks all explain the human IT representational similarity well. So what I'm gonna show you here is uh, a number of different popular computer vision models that are convolutional deep neural networks. And on the vertical axis, you have the accuracy of the human IT representational dissimilarity matrix prediction, which is the group average of Spearman's row, the rank correlation. For each of these models, Kate had four different versions, an untrained version, with uh, just random weights. So this has never been exposed to natural stimuli and hasn't been trained to classify natural stimuli. And a trained version, um, which is trained to categorize images with back propagation. And then uh, for each of these trained and untrained models, there is an unfitted version, which is not in any way fitted to the brain data to the representational dissimilarity matrices that we estimated for the stimuli from the subject's um, brain responses. And there is a fitted version where uh, we fitted a set of weights on principal components of the latent space predicted by each of these models. We see here for AlexNet is that both training the model, so when the model has been exposed to natural uh, stimuli, and has been trained to categorize those stimuli, that helps, that makes it more predictive of the human IT representational space. And fitting the model also helps. Each of these by itself helps by about the same amount. And when you train and fit the model, then you get an additional um, boost. And then when Kate did this for all these different models, she got strikingly similar results here. So this was a little bit of an issue for us because we would like to have a framework for evaluating these models in which we can distinguish qualitatively different architectures. And some of these architectures, they, they share certain features, they're deep and convolutional notably, but they are quite different when you look at, um, at these architectures, at the overall connectivity, the relative depth, and lots of the more detailed decisions here. So this is a problem for us because we want to view these kinds of architectures as models that implement alternative computational theories about vision. And so if we need to be able to do experiments that allow us to adjudicate between them. In this case, all the models were trained and tested on natural images. And we think that the shared features, the deep hierarchy and the convolutional uh, nature of these models uh, explain the relative success of these models. So why can't we distinguish the models in this case? Well, we think that each model's parameter space is too expressive for the distinct inductive biases that these models do have to be revealed when training and testing on natural images and fitting to brain activity data. So these are two examples of where just using natural, natural stimuli fails at uh, distinguishing between even very qualitatively different models. A bigger question that's kind of in the background here is whether we can achieve theoretical progress with these high parametric neural network models. 
And there is a lot of excitement about these models at the moment, but there's also uh, a lot of doubt that people have as to you know, how useful they are to us really for making theoretical progress. My view is that neural network models provide a language for expressing hypotheses about brain computation. That's a very useful language. But like other languages, a language cannot be empirically refuted, right? So neural network models cannot be refuted by, by experiment. However, you can express particular theories, computational theories in neural network models that, that can be refuted. Nevertheless, the parametric complexity uh, can be an issue. It's on the one hand a blessing because we need the high capacity of these models to enable us to capture intelligent behavior. The history of AI has shown that uh, intelligence requires a lot of knowledge about the world. And so we, we can never hope to model cognitive processes and intelligence if we don't allow models that have sufficient capacity to store all the knowledge that's needed for intelligent behavior. And in the case of vision, that's obviously the knowledge about what things look like. If you want to recognize things, if that's, that's the ability that you want to explain and you want a fully explicit model, you, you need to allow your model the capacity to store what things look like so it can recognize these things. So we need this high capacity, it's a blessing. However, it's also a curse because high flexibility makes it hard to adjudicate between models. So the people who are worried about these highly flexible models and are worried about uh, the extent to which we're just engaging in curve fitting, they also have a point, right? And um, an important thing for us as a field to, to think about and struggle with is you know, how to resolve these, these two things that are simultaneously true. So my answer to this question, whether we can achieve theoretical progress with high parametric neural network models is yes, we can achieve theoretical progress with these models and we need these models, in fact, to achieve theoretical progress. But we need severe tests of out of distribution generalization to elicit uh, such models inductive biases. So I think these models that we couldn't distinguish in these um, previous two examples, they do make distinct predictions, but it's not enough to just use a bunch of, of natural stimuli. So <clears throat> this whole line of research on controversial stimuli is really Targo Lanz, and he's my, my co-author on this, this talk. Um, he's really been driving this approach and uh, um, he's been an amazing collaborator. So Tal's two key insights to unpack the contents of the, the previous slide a little bit more were as follows. The first insight is that to elicit models distinct inductive biases, we can test models on a population of stimuli not used in training. So these are out of distribution tests of the models. In order to do that, we could either use natural stimuli that are drawn from a different stimulus population. So for example, a different category of natural stimuli that the model has not been trained with. Or we could use synthetic stimuli, for example, stimuli optimized to elicit bolder predictions, such as uh, stimuli optimized to drive very strong responses, maybe supernaturally strong uh, uh, responses, these so-called maximally exciting stimuli. And the second insight is that since our goal is to adjudicate among models, we can create synthetic stimuli that are optimized to elicit distinct predictions from different models, stimuli that are controversial among the models. I mentioned these maximally exciting stimuli, so there's a, a number of different studies that uh, pursue synthetic stimuli in this framework where you're uh, looking at a unit or at a layer in a model, and then you optimize the stimulus so as to maximally drive that particular unit or that particular 
layer. And that's a related response that also uses synthetic stimuli and uses model-based stimulus optimization. But it's distinct from what we're talking about here. Here, we're talking about controversial stimuli. So for something to be controversial, you need at least two models that the stimulus is going to be controversial between. And what you're optimizing is not the strength of the response somewhere in the model, but some index of controversiality, some controversiality measure. And we're going to look at some um, possible choices for that in a moment. Tal started exploring this in the context of MNIST, where we can have very small models and very qualitatively different feedforward and recurrent models and try to optimize the stimuli to be controversial between the models. We wanted to have a wide variety of qualitatively different models. So we included feedforward and recurrent models, as well as generative and discriminative models, where the discriminative models are models that try to map from images to quantities of interest. And in the case of MNIST, this would be the labels corresponding to the 10 digits. And generative models are models that have some statistical model of the distribution of digit images corresponding to each of the 10 classes of images. So in each of these quadrants, we had a number of different models here, except in the generative feed forward quadrant where it was just a Gaussian kernel density estimator model. And in this case, Tal defined the controversiality index as follows. The controversiality is defined for each model pair and each digit pair, and it's a function of the image. And it's the minimum of four probabilities. And these are the probabilities estimated by the model. And this probability means that the model detects the digit A in the image. So it's a probability uh, assigned by the model that the digit present in the image is an A. And this is the probability that it's not a B. And this is the probability with which model B detects digit B. And this is the probability with which model B uh, judges that the image is not an A, right? So by maximizing this controversiality, we're maximizing this minimum. So we're ensuring that all four probabilities are simultaneously high. And that means that model A detects digit A with high confidence and is also confident that it's not digit B. And model B detects digit B with high confidence and is also highly confident that it's not digit A. So it's a very stringent definition of controversiality. Um, Nico, can I ask a question? Uh, sure. So is this per one stimulus that may include or may not include A and B or some conversion, or is this across many uh, images or stimuli? stimuli? So at the moment, it's for one stimulus, right? So you would put okay. X would be the little bitmap, and then oh, you have image. to specify the two models, and you have to specify um, the two digits that you care about, and okay. then this controversiality is defined. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at this for um, two models, A and B, and two digits, three and seven, by plotting along one axis the contrast between these two probabilities assigned by model A for three and seven the image. So on this side of the axis, model A detects a three, but not a seven. And on this side of the axis, model A detects a seven, but not a three. And along the vertical axis, we're going to plot the model B response. So that's the probability that model B, uh, with which model B detects a seven, minus the probability with which model B detects a, a, a three. 
So I actually, I, I didn't say that well. I should say these are the probabilities assigned to uh, the, the image containing a seven by the model minus the probability that the model assigns to the image containing a, a three. So when we look at it like that, we get these four quadrants. These are the quadrants where the models agree. And these are the quadrants where the models disagree. And look at the MNIST images and not unexpectedly, they fall in the corners here. And that's because MNIST is sort of a, a solved problem of computer vision. So all these models are very good at classifying these images. So all the models are gonna assign extremely similar labels and the labels are also gonna be in agreement with our human subjects. So this is a, a simple way also to understand why um, just using the natural MNIST digits and presenting them to subjects is not a good way to adjudicate between these, these models because all these models are, are really good at MNIST. So they're all gonna make the same predictions as our subjects and as each other. So we can make a controversial stimulus by optimizing this controversiality measure that I introduced in the previous slide, starting from a noise image. And this drives the stimulus into this model disagreement uh, quadrant here, where we get an interesting looking ambiguous stimulus here, which model A uh, classifies as a seven with high confidence and to which model A assigns a very low probability of containing a three, and it's the opposite for model B, right? So when I look at the stimulus, I see a seven, that's maybe because I'm German. And so that would indicate that my perception in this case agrees more with model A than model B. And model B is extremely confident that there's no seven in there and extremely confident that this is a three. So that's an example of a controversial stimuli. So in this way, we can make a controversial, many of these controversial stimuli for all combinations of digits for a given pair of models. And so here's an example of um, controversial stimuli for all combinations of digits for two models, the Capsule Recon model and the Madri L2 model. And in this case, the labels assigned by Capsule Recon agreed better with our subjects' judgments. And I'm gonna show you the behavioral results uh, more formally in a moment, but um, let's just look at a few of the, these matrices. So most of our subjects here assigned labels that were more consistent with Capsule Recon. So they saw columns in this case of consistent digits whose labels agreed with capture net recall. So in this way, we can pit pairs of models against each other. So this contest would be won by capture net recon and then go on and pit capture net recon versus the Gaussian kernel density estimator. In this case, uh, most of our subjects saw rows of consistent digits whose label, label, labels agreed with um, those assigned by a Gaussian kernel density est estimator. When we hit the Gaussian kernel density estimator against the shot analysis by synthesis model, then we found that the shot analysis by synthesis model assigned labels that were more consistent with those assigned by our subjects. So our subject saw columns of consistent digits here. So Tal generated these kinds of controversial stimuli for all combinations of models and all combinations of digits, giving us this really rich set of stimuli to probe these different models with, where we had sort of power for each pair of model comparisons to distinguish these models in behavioral experiments. And the ex behavioral experiment took this form. Uh, the subject looked at one such image at a time and then indicated the probability of presence of each of these 10 digits in the image. 
And these probabilities did not have to add up to one. So like in this case, the subject indicated that there is uh, an eight present with 75% probability and a three present with 50% probability. Um, so there could be uh, multiple digits potentially present in the, in the image. And this was also consistent with how the models were trained. The models um, didn't have softmax outputs that add up to, to one, but they had sigmoid outputs where the models could also assign multiple digit labels to a single image. So Tal did this in an online experiment using a prolific and 30 subjects and included a large number of these controversial stimuli, which were presented in, in randomized order. So here's the results. So what you see here on the horizontal axis is the human response prediction accuracy. So this is Pearson's R, um, the accuracy with which we can predict the human response in this experiment. The first thing to note is this dashed line here, which is the noise ceiling based on the consistency between subjects. So when we leave one subject out and try to predict the held out subject from the average of all the other subjects, we get a sense of the noise in these data and the intersubject uh, variability. And these are uh, sources of variability that we can't uh, expect any model to explain. So this gives us a noise ceiling, which indicates the performance that we would expect for the best possible model. First thing to note here is that all the models are significantly below this noise ceiling. You see the significance here. So there is a significant difference, significant difference and a substantial gap here between the noise ceiling and all of the models. And then the best performing models, which significantly outperformed all of the other models was the shot analysis by synthesis model. And when we look at the best performing three models, they were captioned at recon, the Gaussian kernel density estimator and the shot analysis by synthesis model. And they were all models that have a generative model inside them of the distribution of images corresponding to each of the digits. So that was an interesting um, observation here. Tal then scaled this up to natural images using the CIFAR 10 set of small natural images. And here I'm gonna show you a matrix of controversial stimuli where uh, the focus is on two different categories, cat and horse, and we're looking at all the different models trained to, to categorize these little CIFAR 10 images uh, according to 10 different categories. So we're looking just at these two categories now and all the models. And here's an example of a controversial um, stimulus that's been optimized to look like a cat to the one PCNA6 model and like a horse to the graph wall joint energy 20 model. So to, to me, this looks more like a horse. So my perception is more aligned with the graph wool joint energy model in this case. And the controversy, controversiality index was the same as in the, um, the MNIST example. So again, the graph wool model is very sure that there is a horse here, but not a cat. And the WEN PCN model is very sure that there's a cat and also very sure that there's no horse in this image. When we look at these first three models here, we get these rubbish images that don't really look like anything to us. And these images provide evidence against both of the models in each of these cases, because we look at these images, we see nothing, but each of the two models is very confident that one of these two classes is present and not the other, right? So that's evidence against both of the models. These are also, examples of what's known as adversarial stimuli because they reveal um, the, the shortcomings of the models. And just as a side note, adversarial stimuli are a special case of controversial stimulus where one of the two models that 
the stimulus is controversial between is some kind of stand in for the ground truth that gives you the oracle that gives you the, the true labels. We look at the Angstrom L infinity model. We get some interesting, ambiguous looking images that are maybe more consistent with human perception than. Uh, so for these stimuli, the, the Angstrom prediction is more consistent with human perception than the prediction of these first three models here. And the Angstrom L2 may be a little better than the Angstrom L infinity model. The Gaussian kernel density estimator, which was quite successful, it's a very simple feed forward model of the distribution of images corresponding to a category. And remember, this was very successful for MNIST, but it badly fails in the case of SIFAR 10. So this shows how you know, this very simple approach uh, works for MNIST, but then um, fails very quickly as we look at slightly more complicated vision problems. And by just you know, eyeballing this, this matrix, you can experience that the, the best model for just these two categories uh, appears to be the graph world joint energy model, where the impression that many of us get when looking at these images uh, is more consistent with the label assigned by the graph world joint energy model than um, by any of the other models. And here's the behavioral results, again, along the horizontal, the human response prediction accuracy as Pearson's R. Um, Again, the first thing to note is the noise ceiling is far higher than the performance of the best model, and the noise ceiling is significantly higher. So there's a lot of variance here that's left unexplained by any of the models. But the relatively best performing model is the graph world joint energy model, which is a hybrid generative and discriminative model. The Gaussian KDE model um, here really doesn't work anymore. It's too, too simple and too shallow for this task. Tal is currently working on scaling this up to natural images. And I'm just going to show you a few examples quickly. So this is using the ImageNet uh, set, training set of much larger images. So this involves much larger models. In this case, we're limited to models that are differentiable, where we can uh, use backpropagation down to the level of the pixels to efficiently optimize these images. So here, um, let's quickly look at four different ImageNet trained models uh, and two different categories, Weimarana dog and Persian cat. When we pit these first two models here, the Inception and ResNet 50 against each other, um, we get these uh, strange looking, beautiful images um, that don't really look like, like anything to us. So this would provide some evidence against both of these models. And we, when we pit the adversarially trained models against these first two models, we get interesting looking um, stimuli here that seem to have some of the features of Weimarana dogs. So we're interested in getting into psychophysics with this. And similarly, when we optimize the stimuli um, to look like Persian cats to the adversarially trained models, um, get maybe somewhat ambiguous stimuli. So it's in the eye of the beholder and we really need psychophysics here. But when we pit the two adversarially trained models against each other, um, we get these stimuli, which are really, um, look like monsters and provide at least some evidence, I think, against both of these adversarially trained models. Tal also took this to the domain of language. So now we're gonna change gears and look at language models. And this was a collaboration with Chris Baldassano's lab and Matt Siegelman, a very brilliant grad student in Chris Baldassano's lab. So in this um, exploration of language models, we had a wide variety of, again, qualitatively very different uh, language models. 
each of which can assign a probability to a given sentence. So we looked at um, the predictions of those models of the probabilities of English sentences. The simplest form of model um, is this n-gram family, like the bigram and trigram model, which just looks at a large corpus of text and then counts how many times phrases of length two or length three uh, occurred in that corpus. And on that basis, it can assign a probability to any, any possible um, sentence. So this is based on text corpus frequencies of unique phrases of length n. We also included classical neural network models trained on language, including recurrent neural networks and long short-term memory recurrent neural networks. These are recurrent neural nets that use fixed token embeddings. And we included these modern uh, transformer neural network models. And we had five different examples of these, including GPT-2 which is the smaller brother of GPT-3. So these are neural nets that use context-dependent embeddings and multiple attention heads. So to give some intuition, let's think about the space of all sentences, which is a discrete probability space as a continuous space. And we can think of each of the models, for example, the model BERT as assigning a probability to each of these sentences. So that's some kind of distribution um, in sentence space where there are high probability sentences and low probability sentences. And a different model will have a different distribution over sentence space, assigning high probability to a different um, set of sentences. So there'll be some portion here of sentence space where the models agree, either they agree that the sentence is likely or they agree that the sentence is unlikely. And there'll be some portion here where the sentence is controversial, where one model thinks the sentence is a likely sentence in English and the other thinks it's an unlikely sentence. So this is a, a simple way to think about the controversiality of sentences. What Tal and Matt and Chris did here was to start from a natural sentence to anchor these synthetic sentences they wanted to make to pit these models against each other in a natural sentence, and then optimize that uh, sentence such that the probability assigned by GPT-2 to, to the sentence was minimized, while the probability assigned to the sentence by BERT was kept at least the same. So the constraint was that, you know, in the eyes of BERT, you needed to stay on this plateau of high probability while moving to the lowest possible probability according to GPT-2. So that's a way of, <clears throat> of moving into this, this controversial um, domain here. And then of course, you can also do the opposite, start from a natural sentence and go to a sentence that minimizes the probability according to BERT while keeping the probability according to GPT-2 at least the same. So here's an example of sentences. So the natural sentence they started with in this example is this is the lie you have been sold. And then they, they optimized the, the sentence according to these two um, criteria. And this optimization was a discrete optimization where they just randomly picked one of the eight words in the sentence and then considered replacing that word with each word in the dictionary and then checked you know, how probable it is according to each of the models in order to take steps and, and optimize. When they minimized the probability according to GPT-2, they got the sentence, this is the week you have been dying. So this is a grammatical sentence. However, it's a somewhat odd sentence because of its meaning. 
And it's not a sentence you would expect to encounter in English with high probability. And when they minimize the probability according to BERT while keeping the probability according to GPD-2 at least the same, they got the sentence, that is the narrative we have been sold, which is a perfectly natural grammatical English sentence um, that's probably been, been uttered many times. So in this case, uh, human perception agreed more with GPD-2 than with BERT. The way this experiment was performed was by pitting two sentences against each other. So subjects were not judging the probability of single sentences. That would be a, another way of doing it. But um, we opted here to show subjects two sentences and uh, have them indicate which of them is more likely to be encountered in English. We also took confidence ratings here at three different levels, but I'm not going to show you analysis of the confidence levels here, but just the binary decisions. So which, uh, uh, so it's about how well the models predict these binary decisions um, for pairs of sentences. First, when this experiment was done with random natural sentences, these were the results. Again, along the uh, horizontal here, you have the human choice prediction accuracy. And Here's the chance level, which is 50%, because there's always two sentences. And um, so you know, you're picking which one is more likely to be encountered in English. And what you see here is to what extent those choices agree with the human choices. So chance is 50%. And each of these dots here is a full replication of the experiment with new subjects and new stimuli. So the variability of these dots, um, if we uh, use that variance to compare models and to compare each of the models to a noise ceiling, um, this corresponds to treating both the subjects and the experimental stimuli as random variables. And the inference would then be expected to generalize to new subjects and new stimuli. And that's always what we really want, right? We're not interested in results that hold just for our set of subjects or our set of stimuli, but we want to generalize. So that's, that's an important aspect of this. And in gray, again, here is the, the noise ceiling. So what we see here is that all the models come quite close to the noise ceiling, and there are no significant differences between any of the models. And that includes these, these super naive models, the bigram and trigram models, as well as very sophisticated transformer neural network models. Um, that, that have learned um, a huge amount from exposure to these large text corpora. When we use controversial sentences, we see much greater differences between the models, and we get a lot of significant differences between the models as well. Um, here, the stars indicate that models are significantly below the noise ceiling. So this uh, is not the case for the top three models here but uh, is the case for all the, all the other models. And in, <clears throat> but in this case, the controversial sentences were actually natural controversial sentences. So they were natural sentences from corpora that were selected to be controversial among the models. When we use synthetic controversial sentences, like the ones I showed you in the, uh, in the previous slide, then we get an even starker picture where we're able to uh, find significant failings of all of the models except GPD-2, and we get uh, more of the pairwise comparison significant as well. We combine all of the data together, so all of the sentence pairs, uh, all of the different um, stimulus conditions. We really have a lot of power to show the failings of all of the models, even GPT-2, and to compare the models and see differences in performance uh, at predicting the human choices among these models. So zooming out and getting to the conclusion, there's a longstanding debate, notably in vision science, between two practices, the use of artificial stimuli 
which are controlled and designed to adjudicate between models and which are often simpler, and the use of natural stimuli, which are less controlled and more ecologically valid and often complex. And controversial stimuli can also be conceptualized as kind of going into the continuum between these two extremes, where we uh, design controlled stimuli to adjudicate between models, but our models uh, are complex models that have a lot of visual knowledge, and therefore the resulting stimuli also have features of natural stimuli. And we think that this is an interesting sort of synthesis um, between that, that could combine, you know, if we manage to, to pull it off, uh, the attractive features of each of these two approaches. So in conclusion, controversial stimuli provide optimized probes for adjudicating among computational hypotheses. They reveal distinct inductive biases of different deep net models. Human vision may rely on a computational mechanism that combines elements of discriminative and generative inference. So these models that had generative components in general did better in, in the vision studies. And current language models differ in their ability to recognize high probability English sentences, but none of them can fully account for human judgments of the relative likeliness of sentences. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nico. Um, I'd like to ask everybody to unmute yourselves and let's give uh, Nico a very big uh, applaud for a very uh, inspiring and uh, now uh, not controversial talk, but now we have to uh, think of what would be controversial. Anyway, um, yes, um, um, opening the stage for uh, questions. Okay, I can start. Um, I'm okay. So Yara, you have um, you can go ahead. Hi Nico, uh, thanks Hi, very Yara, much. Good to see you again. Yeah, you too. Uh, and thank you for the talk. I really like this uh, approach um, uh, of using the controversial stimuli. Uh, but I want to go back to one of your own questions during the talk: whether we can achieve any theoretical progress with these uh, with these kind of stimuli. So, so, so you have some nice conclusion. But I, do you have um, uh, any? Any thought about where this can take us in terms of theoretical progress and understanding human vision or how to improve um, our artificial networks? Yeah, I think um, we can start with different theories and then implement these theories and models and adjudicate between the models to draw conclusions about the theories, right? So, for example, I would say that. The results in the domain of vision on MNIST and CIFAR 10 so far, um, which we're beginning to push to these larger and more naturalistic images, um, give us hints about how these processes work. Um, they give us a hint in particular that a purely discriminative approach might not be sufficient, that there are, there are generative processes in vision that, that play a role. And so they, they give us uh, a clear indication as to the direction we want to move in with our modeling work, right? And so, you know, there's always, there's a fundamental problem here, which is that, of course, any theory can be implemented in an infinite number of different possible models. And every model has an infinite number of possible instances for example, when you take the same architecture and you train it again with a different random sample of, of images. So these are sort of levels of description and uncertainty that we have to think very carefully about how to deal with. Um, and that's just inherently hard, but I think uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can you know, build a framework. I wouldn't say we have the framework yet. There's a lot of work to be done. And in this new age of big models, and big neural data sets, 
we need to reinvent our, our methodology. And I, you know, I would say we're just finding our feet here and uh, you know, nothing we have is, is perfect or um, completely compelling at this stage, but I'm hopeful that we can, we can get there and we can draw theoretical conclusions from building these big models and, and testing them. Thanks. Um, Peter? Hi, Nico, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I have a very... Can you guys hear me? Yes, we do. Okay, perfect. Um, I, I have a specific question. It's about the upper limits on the on, on prediction, essentially the one you used for establishing a ceiling on how the extent to which even the best possible model can predict the human responses. So um, I, are you sure that that's an upper ceiling? Because I think you may be underestimating the upper ceiling there because you're comparing, uh, say, prediction of a group of observers against a real observer that has intrinsic noise, obviously, but the model presumably has no intrinsic noise. So the model has to be able to do slightly better than uh, what you get from comparing human against human. Yeah, that's exactly right. And we worry about that a lot. So what we're showing there is what we think of as an estimate of a lower bound on yes. the performance of the true model. And that's exactly as you said, because there's also noise in the human data that we mm. use uh, as a stand-in for the true model, right? So we can, we can think of this and um, in different ways, but one good way to think about it is that we use other people as a stand-in for the performance of the true model. And since there's noise in those data, uh, we expect to underestimate the performance of the true model. So this is why yes. we often draw the noise ceiling as a gray bar, which has a lower bound and an upper bound. And we think of that as an estimate of the range that we would fall, that we would expect the true model to fall in in its performance. And this is also why we take an asymmetrical approach. So this is not just the retest reliability, right? But it's using, uh, holding one subject out and then using all the other subjects to predict that one subject. This is to reduce that bias that you're talking about to a minimum because we're averaging all the other subjects. Um, you know, if we have a lot of subjects, the variability of that prediction uh, would become quite small, right? It would, it would uh, yes. fall off with the, with the uh, square root of the number of um, held out subjects. But it is yes. a lower bound estimate. I, I actually, I mean, right now, you know, I would have to think about it because this is a slightly different scenario than the one I dealt with. Normally I deal with, uh, say, the, the observer responding twice to the same set of stimuli and you have a similar situation. So you can estimate the upper seat, the, 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 the maximum predictability theoretically by any model also from the agreement of the subject with himself or herself. And yeah. um, I derived this actually analytically. And so you, the, the, you're right. So the lower bound is uh, essentially the agreement itself, but you do have an upper bound potentially Mm -hmm. And this upper bound, uh, so I derived a simple formula for the, uh, for the case of, say, an alternative for choice with the subject responding twice to the same stimuli. I don't know where that, whether that derivation would apply to your scenario. Uh, it may need to be tweaked a little bit, but, uh, but there is possibly a way of estimating that, that upper ceiling. But yeah. in your case, your models fall below already, mostly the lower bound, so... It's not a big issue. Yeah, it would be yeah. fun to discuss this. We're thinking about this um, quite a lot. So in, in the context of representational similarity analysis, the way we get the upper bound is by using all the subjects to predict each of the subjects without holding out the subject, right? So then mm -hmm. your prediction is overfitted and you would therefore expect to overestimate um, the performance of the, the true model. So you have a cross-validated version where you expect to underestimate it and a non-cross-validated version where you expect to overestimate it and then you get your two upper bounds. But it would be very interesting for me to see your 
uh, approach to this. And it's also interesting to, to think about what to do when you just have one subject or you're interested when you're interested in modeling each individual subject, which is um, not the framework that I've been talking about, but also important for a range of scientific questions that we care about. Yeah, I, I will just send you the, the reference and then we can discuss it over email. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, Ellie. Hi. So first, thank you for this. And uh, just an observation before I ask my question or comment. I, when you showed the, the matrix that compared a, a cat and a horse, and you were saying that there's no cat here visible or no horse. I clearly saw a cat and a horse, even uh, one layer lower, or one, uh, one quality lower than you were saying. And, and when you added the next one, it confirmed me, to me that what I was seeing is the cat face, was the cat face, because a cat, I could think of not just the cat face, but rather the cat body. But I clearly saw a cat face in the lower and and it, even the next one you said there's no cat here boo it for me was a perfectly good cat and the horse was um similarly uh reasonable not this one no the er earlier one yes yes so in the in the angstroms i see a cat And I saw the cat. Yes, this this column is a cat for me. <laughs> uh, this totally. One. So again, where's the where's your cursor? Yeah, yeah this, this one, and certainly the next one. This one was ambiguous. I could see other things there, but this one I saw a cat. Yeah. Um, and, the, and the question I ask myself: Is it a cat face, or that you're talking about, or a cat body? Right, you didn't uh, made it apparent. What are you talking about? But for me, this was a cat face. So the next image, the Gaussian, which you also said was no good, confirmed to me that it's a cat face. Um, it's, you know, and 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 uh, and then in this in the angstrom, I see horses um, on the row. Uh, the one for infinity. The first one is a horse going left, the next one is a horse going right, and another one horse going right. Um, so, and, and uh, it, it certainly uh, continue for the next uh, column for the L2. So I, I'm just raising an issue with uh, this interpretation and I understand it's an N of one and it's me, uh, but uh, it's a very strong impression that I had and at least with a cat face, I made the distinction that I see a cat face rather than a cat body. And the next one confirmed that indeed you're showing a cat, um, a cat face, right? Okay. Uh, so this, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is. I mean, this clarifies. I'm. I'm not doing this well, right? I should just shut up about my own percepts as I'm explaining this. And I should just right. say what you did here. <laughs> right, and you made some comments like, about uh, maybe because like, of German. Like horses and cats to these different models yes. to different degrees, yes. right? And then I should leave it to you to uh, come to your own, own conclusion, right? So uh, that, that was, I didn't do that very well. Right. And no, I, 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 I don't have to do this. that better. But the I mean, data, the, the, data the, point, be... the point, of course, is the ambiguity of all of this, right? And this is why we need to do the actual experiments and yes, have yes. subjects carefully judge their subjective probability for each of these 10 categories, right? And there's going to be a variation across subjects, substantial Absolutely. variability. And we need to take that into account, of course, in all of the the inferences, right? Um, in some cases, it's so clear that it's uh, that it's seductive to make the shortcut to just say, you know, we can all agree we yeah. see a horse here and not a cat, <laughs> um, and that's didactically useful. But you know, there are many ambiguous um, cases. I agree with you 
where it's better to um, just not make those judgments because it's totally unscientific, right? We just need to do the experiments. We need to ask our subjects and then we can formally compare uh, different models uh, with respect to the degree to which they predict subject behavior. All right, and the other thing I wanted to mention to if, if people don't know or maybe know about it, if, since you're talking about vision, um, this approach was needed uh, very much when they did the spatial standard observer for contrast sensitivity, trying to the, the distinguish different models of uh, contrast sensitivity. And of course, they did the whole big study in multiple places and the unfortunate but predictable result was that there was no difference between the models. I think there were six or seven models and they couldn't distinguish between the 52 stimuli. And when this was launched at Arvo, at a meeting at Arvo, I stood up and suggested that the modelers will do what you're suggesting, find the controversial stimuli. I didn't use that word. It's a very good term, but, <laughs> uh, but I suggested exactly that. And, and they told me that the experimenters will never follow the modelers in uh, selecting the stimuli. So the question is, how do you convince the experimenters to do that? Now, I, one way to do it is to do, have the same person as the modeler and the experimenter. But <laughs> um, I, I think there's a, a real importance to the point that you're raising, but there is objection to it. And, and when we get results, some of them with yours that the models don't distinguish what do we learn from that is there must be something, and you raised some of these too, that maybe there's no difference underlying, even though the model looks like it's different, it's really either doing the same thing or is actually under the hood, it's the same model. Um, all these things are important and they are the way to possibly uh, answer the question is, do we make, um, Progress, theoretical progress. The theoretical progress is not just to say that these two. Okay. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful points. I, I agree with all of them. Uh, I love this example from classic uh, vision. Um, I love that you said, you know, the experimenters might be ignoring the modelers and the way they. Uh, design their experiments and that that's wrong and that the experimenters and the modelers should increasingly be the same people and if not they should come together and work together uh, you know to design experiments that can help us adjudicate between important models that implement different theories all of these are great points and I think there are these these challenges between different cultures so somewhat separate groups of people and so, you know, we need to just overcome these by bringing them together at the same conferences like cognitive computational neuroscience and uh, starting collaborations to, to resolve these issues. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Hagi, do you want to add, um, Nico, is it okay that we continue? Yeah, sure. Okay, lovely. So Hagi, you're next. Thank you. Um, so Nico, hi, and thanks again for a really great talk. Um, so you converge to a controversial stimuli, uh, you and then you ask um, uh, human subjects for their perception or, or categorization of the, of the uh, stimuli, but you could converge to a different local minima, maybe start from a different seed random or some randomization, and you might get a different human response. So my question is, this controversial region there, how smooth is it? Is it like um, Swiss cheese holes with uh, controversial examples all over the place? Or if you jitter them or try to traverse from one to the other, do you traverse from one human uh, category to another human category in terms of perception? That's fascinating. And I don't have really good things to say about it. I mean, we're wondering about this a lot. Obviously it depends on the models and the stimulus domain. Um, right, so for some it might be simpler than for others, but you're exactly right. There's uh, not just one controversial stimulus for one pair of uh, labels and one pair of models, but a whole distribution. 
that may be controversial to different degrees and what that function is over image space and how smooth it is are really mm -hmm. interesting questions. We should always think of them as distributions of stimuli, right? And we mm -hmm. should be looking to, um, with our statistical inference, to abstract from that variability and, and treat that as noise. But um, yeah, there is also inherently just interesting questions about the, the nature of how the controversiality varies across uh, image space. Thank you. Lovely, thank you. Asaf, do you wanna have a, um, do you wanna ask? Yeah, thank you. Uh, first, thank you, Nico. It's, uh some really great ideas. And I think my, my question is, is related to Hagit's question for a bit. Uh, I wondered if you're aiming to use this method to also fine tune deep learning. I mean, you could use this data set of how people see these uh, controversial stimuli to retrain the models and retrain the, the weights of the models to be more accurate. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's an interesting approach. Uh, I mean, the adversarial stimuli were initially used to highlight problems of the models, but then um, as you've seen in, in my talk, adversarial stimuli can also be used to train models and to improve models and address these problems, right? And so controversial stimuli um, are a generalization of adversarial stimuli and could be used in a similar way. Right? And the advantage of controversial stimuli in this domain would be that you don't have to have a stand-in for the ground truth, but rather you can pit each model against a number of other models and uh, make, make progress that way, even in domains where you, you don't have the true labels and you don't want to make the assumption that is often made in work on adversarial stimuli that the uh, images that are close in a, in a ball around a given stimulus that you have a label for should all have the same label.